Hello, I'm Kathy Grady. We're here today at the Longmeadow Adult Center um, talking about living history. We're going to talk to people who have lived through a lot of history in Longmeadow. And today, we're fortunate enough to have with us Guy D'Antonio, who's lived in Longmeadow 88 years. Thank you for coming, Guy. I really appreciate it. Well, it's a pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> You've seen a lot in Longmeadow I'm over still, those yeah, years. I'm still breeding, <laughs> ripening, and tolerating old age aches and pains. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Uh huh. Yeah. So, um, you came to Longmeadow when and why? Well, my father lost his job I mean, in New Haven, Connecticut. I was born in New Haven, Connecticut. At seven years old, we moved to Longmeadow. My father found a job at the International Casket Company next to the Big Little Sanford. Where's but we were very poor people, very, very poor. And my father was a stonemason. So we had nowhere to live, and he built this one-car garage, good-sized garage with a little uh, kitchenette in it. And there were seven of us that lived in that garage. Oh, from that time until 19... 34, and then we built an eight-room house on Meadow Road. Oh, nice. So was it a garage of a family member? The, the garage in what? Was That's right. who lived in the house? Yes, there was four, seven of us lived in that garage. I had my mother and father, and there was four children, and a crippled old uncle that lived with us there. Yeah. And we were very, very poor. And this was a remote area. There wasn't anything in here at that time. Uh, the meadows are wide open, a lot of woods, and there's no houses. And I was very, very lonely because I had nobody to play with at my age. I had a, You were a first grader. Yeah, I was, well, well, at that time I was about, oh, nine, ten years old when I met a boy on Barrington Road. His name was Floyd Myrick. And he had a dog by the name of Buster. And that dog was with us all the time, wherever we went. But the meadows are wide open to us. We could go from the Connecticut line all the way to Springfield line. And uh, Down behind the houses on Long Meadow Street. Well, we used to go through the meadows because the meadows was nothing but farmland at that time. There's oh, right. Of, Mr. Pomeroy up here had a lot of cattle down there. He, is and, that where he kept his cattle down there? Not on... The east side of Long Meadow Street. He had he had them over here. He used to bring some down there too. Hmm. And uh, he was our milkman. Mr. Pomeroy was. Mr. Pomeroy used to deliver milk with his, with his horse and wagon. And uh, in the winter time, he used to plow the sidewalks, and he used to put bells on his horse, and we could hear him coming from a long way a distance <laughs> away. But um, we had a very hard life too. Uh, we were very, very poor, and things just, and then actually, the, in October of 29, the, the crash, I think it was in October 29. Black Friday. My mother had a, a little wood stove for the winter time and summer, and spring, in a hot, hot summer, she had a gas stove to do her, do her cooking on. She used to make everything, bread, biscuits, and what have you. My father was a great gardener. He had big gardens. And he used to supply all the neighborhood with all fruits and so forth. Uh, very memorable to me. He had, I think, three different, he liked to graft fruit. On a little sickle tree, he had, I think, three or four different pears growing off of that one little tree. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, but we had a hard life. When we first came here, you talk about discrimination. <clears throat> they had a petition out. They didn't want any Catholic Guinea, Guinea Wops in their area, so oh. they had a petition to put us out. But Mr. Out of town? Out of town. They didn't want us in town. No Italians need apply? Well, that's a quirk of some people. Except Mr. Brass across the street, he was a Scottish man. He said, I wish I had 10 families like them around here. But nevertheless, we stayed. But we, uh, <clears throat> we had a pot belly stove, and it was hard doing homework under kerosene lamps in a small room, believe me. 
it was hard. Then you know, well, Sundays mostly after Sundays after dinner, we go down the railroad tracks and pick up coal off the railroad tracks that the train used to drop off. Falling there. off the cars. Yeah. yeah. Then I used to do a lot of trapping down there. I used to trap muskrats a lot. Oh yeah. Well, I trapped the whole meadows all the way to Connecticut River. The only road that led to the Connecticut River, and even today, I don't know, was Meadow Road. That was the only road that went directly to the river. <clears throat> and what I used to do is trap all those ponds, and I'd go as far as the Connecticut River. And I'll tell you how hard it was. I used to get up probably three times a week after I set the traps. I'd get up about 4 o'clock in the morning, put on my hip boots, and then I'd pick up my little twenty two rifle and go down there and watch it. Uh, Watch my traps. If I caught anything and I had a sack, I'd bring it home. When I got home from school, I'd dress out the furs and so forth and stretch my furs on stretch box and so forth. When See, I had enough of them, we used to sell them. Sears Roebuck used to sell, give us the most price for furs at that time. They did? Yes. That was just like the first settlers here. Yeah. They came for the beaver and they sold mm -hmm. the furs. So uh, you went to Norway school, yes. which is now the Willie Ross School. I went to Norway. That's tell a you, little school, right? I went through Norway school and junior high school in the center of town. And then center I went, school was the yeah. junior high. I yeah. want to tell you a little quirk about Norway Street School. Okay. In the fourth grade, we had a wonderful teacher. Her name was Miss Powers, and she was a really attractive girl. But to us, she's old, you know. Oh, yeah, way old, yeah. In those days, the, the, school, the teacher had the author to go ahead and give you a strap it on your hand if you were acted up, you know. But not her. She used to grab you and give you a big kiss. I'm telling you, you'd rather take the biggest beating on earth instead of getting a kiss from his power. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. You didn't like the kiss. Nobody liked the kiss? Well, I never got in trouble there. I, uh. I got in trouble in the eighth grade. I never got in trouble anywhere. But I mean, then the kids out, you know, recess time, well, you were kissed by Miss Powers today. So, <laughs> That's so I funny. Thought, I thought you'd like that. I do. So was that how that had and the five fourth grades grade. to and, the, fourth and the fourth grade? grade yeah. And then you went to center school? I went to the center, up the, we, go to, the wrong we go to sixth grade in Norway. Oh, sixth. And seven, eight, and nine, to the center school, and all the, the Long Meadow Junior High School. All the kids in Long Meadow went kids, to the yeah. one junior yeah. high. Then we'd have to take a trolley car to the Springfield schools, and after that, so. Um, but this area was uh, really remote. There was hardly anything, uh, buildings here and so forth. Um, but there was a trolley car. Well, it was a trolley car. That trolley car. Went as far as straight line Connecticut. That's where Sharkey's was in straight line. Then it was Sharkey's was uh, well, across the street. Sharkey's on the west side of Route Five. Then on the east side of Route Five, that's where the trolley was. And you can get a transfer. You go all the way to Hartford if you wanted on on for how my much? trolley. For how much? Oh gosh, it's very cheap. I don't remember. Okay. But the trolley is to go. From State Line on the east side of Route 5, down through the center of the green, down Picasa Hill, which was a very steep hill, and up Long Hill Street, as far as Fort Pleasant Avenue, when on, uh, when, uh, Summer Avenue, then they made a left hand turn on Fort Pleasant Avenue, down in the Main Street, as far as Vernon Street. Then the conductor would get out and turn the trolley pole around. Turn the seats back right, so you can right. face front and come back this way. But uh, because the hill was pretty steep in those days. And that's where 91 goes into Springfield. Yeah, that's where it is now. Yeah. Actually, that uh, was really straightened out when, when the 91 was put in. 91 was put in. In the 50s. 1958, wasn't it? It opened in 60. Well, they, that's why I read. I, at, at that time, I came back from the service. I designed and built my own house before we got married. So she had her own house and nobody to count out to. And they came and surveyed the top of the hills all the way down. 
and we were we were on pins and needles. We didn't know whether they were going to take our house or not. And that was 1951. And where, uh, was, your, where was your house? On, on Homestead Boulevard. On Homestead. And that was uh, when they started, it was probably 1955, 56, yeah, yeah. somewhere in there. When it, the first survey. They didn't want to go down through the meadows. the meadows. They said it was wetlands. But they did go down through the meadows and wetlands. Finally, yeah. And lucky they had William Street. That's all sand because they hauled a lot of fill around that dun, sand dun area where the Hukilau is now. Yes. That area there. I, I dug a lot of ditches for 25 cents an hour on that street, all the way to you East Long Meadow Lane. In the you summertime, we used to get... Oh, yeah. In the summertime, they used to hire us. And in those days, regardless of what, you, it's a fair day's pay for fair day's work. When they dug a ditch, they went a certain depth, then they put in a wooden platform. And the other man had to go down below you. So he would have to shovel from the bottom onto that platform, and you would have to shovel from the platform oh, out. That's a deep ditch. And you had to keep up with that man. We got 25 cents an hour. <laughs> Except uh, my father was a stonemason, and he put in all the catch basins and all the sewers areas. And I was his tender when he worked at it. I used to be make the cement and carry the bricks. I was a hot carrier for him, you know, at that time. In the summer or after the, school? In the uh, summertime. In the summer. Then we used to do a lot of um, caddying in Longmeadow. Oh, four, you did? Uh, 13, at Longmeadow Country 13 Club? 13 years old. We used to walk all the way from Homestead to the Longmeadow Country Club. And we used to caddy for 18 holes for 60 cents. <laughs> all right. They yeah. tip you? Oh, and, yeah, I mean, it's, we used to get t little tips, maybe 75 cents from some people, but the cheapest people were the bankers. You don't get anything from the bankers. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> you never get anything from the bankers. <clears throat> and, uh, <clears throat> they, I hear uh, over at the Longmeadow Country Club, they have a picture of during the war, the Second World War, um, Gas was rationed. Oh, yeah. So they had a horse and wagon that would pick up the golfers on Long Meadow Street yeah. in their wingtip shoes, their suits, to go over and put yeah. on their golfing yeah. clothes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they did. Uh, Walter Camp was a ration. He, used to, he was a man on a rationing board. And he was a oh, rationing board. He, oh. you know, his name was, and he was a banker. He was the head of a bank, I guess. Walter. Walter V. Camp, or anyway, his name was Walter Camp, and he had two children, Chick and another girl. Or, but you don't get any tips from him. <laughs> so, uh, the, how did the rationing board work? Well, well, I was here when you would they, get coupons. Yes, uh, but I wasn't here long enough. Oh, right, you were I, uh, fighting the war. Yeah. Did you marry? You married after the war. Yes. Well. I never, wife, my wife's the only girl I ever had, and she's the first girl that was ever hired in our industrial engineering department. But You were uh, working in an industrial engineering department? Yes, I was. And uh, she was a smart woman. She was a graduate of Mount Holyoke of Ivy League College, and also Bay Path. And they wanted her to keep on teaching at Bay Path, and she didn't want to teach. <clears throat> so, uh, she married a smart Well, I, I knew I was going to war. I never expected to get back. What the Japanese took in six months, it took us three years to get it back. Yeah. But I did come back, but not, not as healthy as I went over. And uh, I lost my hearing and my eye, part of my eyesight, and then I have malaria and everything else to go with it. So that's what you pay. What I had to pay for the price of war. Yeah. And it's very little compared to what other people have gone through. Right, you're still here. 